Welcome to the University of Virginia. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks here from out of town and we appreciate your coming. Uh, we are very fortunate to have today with us uh, my friend and mentor, uh, Randy Pausch. I first met, met Randy at 1992 when I became a professor here uh, at UVA. And I was lucky enough to recognize um, Randy's greatness early on. And uh, his honesty, courage, and grace were very striking even back then. As a mentor, Randy has been sort of a cross between uh, Yoda, uh, Captain Kirk, and uh, Jim Carrey. <laughs> and his unique combination of wisdom and leadership and humor has taught me many important life lessons over the years. Randy always gave me and everybody else honest advice that was untainted by uh, political correctness and in fact sometimes untainted by politeness even, but <laughs> I appreciate that greatly because as a mentor that's exactly what you want and I owe a lot of my success to him and he's been a perfect mentor. There's an old saying that talent does what it can but genius does what it must and Randy's genius has been a valuable asset to me and to many many others over the years. His sharp wit has made us laugh many, many times, and still does. And Randy repeatedly reminded us that those who think that you can't have a lot of fun while getting an education probably don't know much about either. Indeed, Randy has raised the level of fun in education to an entirely new dimension. And uh, we will forever be grateful to him for doing so and for the wonderful value that he added uh, to our lives. And Randy's impact will continue to touch and affect many, many people across the world for many, many years to come. And now I would like to introduce our Dean of Engineering, Jim Aylor, which has a few more things to say about Randy. Thank you. Wow, uh, it's really great to see everyone here uh, and we School of Engineering and Applied Science is really excited that you've come to help us uh, honor our colleague and friend Randy Pausch. Uh, my understanding is that the, every seat is filled so we really do uh, appreciate everyone uh, being with us. What I want to do right now is just give you a little bit of background on Randy. Uh, I know a lot of you know about him either directly or indirectly, but then I want to make a couple of announcements uh, that are special to us here at the University of Virginia in the School of Engineering and, and special in terms of uh, uh, an initial announcements of things that are going to happen. Randy received his BS degree in computer science from Brown University in 1982 and his PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon University in 1988. Directly from CMU, he joined the Faculty of Computer Science at the University of Virginia, where he successfully was granted tenure. During his time at Virginia, he established a major research activity in the general area of human-computer interaction. Probably more importantly, he was a dedicated educator and served as a mentor for many students and many of his colleagues. One of the most important and most successful initiatives while at Virginia was the ALICE software project, a computer animation design tool which has proven very effective at getting and keeping middle school girls interested in computers. In fact, thanks to an agreement with Electronic Arts, the next version of ALICE will use the 3D characters and animation from The Sims, the most popular PC video game in history. This is an outstanding accomplishment for Randy, but even more important, it will be the major contribution, will be a major contribution to efforts to increase literacy, literacy in computer science. On behalf of Bob Pianta, Dean of the Curry School of Education and myself, I am pleased to announce that the University of Virginia Young Women's Leader, Young Woman Leaders Program 
a well-established mentoring program of the University of Virginia Women's Center and the Curry School of Edu Education that pairs at-risk middle school girls with college women with the goal of boosting the self-esteem and leadership skills of both groups, is now planning to incorporate ALICE into its mentoring program through a collaborative effort with the Department of Computer Science. This initiative will allow both the middle school girls and their college mentors to receive exposure to computing concepts through design of three-dimensional animated virtual worlds. This will impact several important fronts, all near and dear to Randy's heart, including encouraging young women to enter technology fields, helping at-risk groups, and building cross-disciplinary bridges. The university is honored to be able to incorporate Randy's great legacy into this worthwhile endeavor. At Carnegie Mellon, Randy co-founded the Entertainment Technology Center, an activity based on the principle of having technologists and non-technologists work together on projects that produce artifacts that are in intended to entertain, inform, and inspire. He has also worked for a period with Disney, Walt Disney's Imagineering. I'm also pleased to let you know that Disney-owned publisher Hyperion has just announced plans to publish a book about Randy called The Last Lecture, which will be co-authored by Randy and Wall Street Journalist reporter Jeff Zaslow. Throughout everything Randy does, there is an infectious and inspiring enthusiasm. That spirit is intact today, even though he is facing a very difficult time. A husband and the father of three, Randy is a smart, funny, courageous man. I am thankful that he chose to spend this day with us, and I'm honored to welcome him back to the University of Virginia grounds. And now, please join me in welcome, welcoming Professor Randy Pausch. Thank you. That, that's very kind, but never tip the waiter before the meal arrives. Um, it's, uh, thank you, Gabe and Jim. I, I couldn't imagine uh, being more uh, grateful for an introduction. These are two people that I've known a long, long time. Uh, I taught here at the University of Virginia. I love this school. It's just an incredible place filled with tradition and history and respect, uh, the kind of qualities that I really admire, that I want to see preserved in American society. And this is one of the places that I, I just love for preserving that. I think the honor code alone at the University of Virginia just is something that every university administrator should study and look at and say, you know, why can't we do that too? So I think there are a lot of things about this place to love. Uh, I'm uh, going to talk today on the topic of time management. Uh, the circumstances are, as you probably know, a little bit unusual. Uh, I think at this point I'm an authority to talk about what to do with limited time. Uh, my, uh, my battle with pancreatic cancer started about a year and a half ago, fought, did all the right things, but it's, you know, as my oncologist said, if you could pick off a list, that's not the one you'd want to pick. So on August 15th, uh, these were my CAT scans. You can see that if you scroll through all of them, there were about a dozen tumors in my liver. And the doctors at that time said, uh, you are likely to have three to, I love the, the way they say it, you have three to six months of good health left. Right? Optimism and, and positive phrasing. It's sort of like when you're at Disney, what time does the park close? The park is open until 8. <laughs> so I have three to six months of good health. Well, let's do the math. Today is three months and 12 days. So what I had on my day timer for today was not necessarily being at the University of Virginia. I'm pleased to say that we do treat with palliative chemo. They're going to buy me a little bit of time on the order of a few months if it continues to work. Uh, I am still in perfectly good health. Um, with Gabe in the audience, I'm not going to do push-ups because I'm not going to be shown up. Uh, <laughs> Gabe is really in good shape. Uh, but uh, I, I continue to be in relatively good health. I had chemotherapy yesterday. You should all try it. It's great. Uh, 
Uh, but it, it does sort of beg the question, I have finite time. Uh, some people have said, you know, so why are you going and giving a talk? Well, there are a lot of reasons I'm coming here and giving a talk. Uh, one of them is that uh, I said I would. All right, that's a pretty simple reason, and I'm physically able to. Another one is that uh, going to the University of Virginia is not like going to some foreign place. People say, aren't you spending all your time with family? And by coming back here for a day, I am spending my time with family both metaphorically and literally, because it turns out that many of you have probably seen this picture from the talk that I gave. Um, these are my niece and nephew, uh, Chris and Lara. And uh, my niece, Lara, is actually a senior, oh, a fourth year. <laughs> here at Mr. Jefferson's University. So uh, Laura, could you stand up so they see what you, you've gotten taller? There we are. <laughs> and I, I couldn't be happier to have her here at this university. Um, and the other, the other person, so that's Laura, the other person in this picture is Chris. Uh, and uh, Chris, if you could stand up so they see you've gotten much taller. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And they, they have grown in so many ways, not just in height. And it's been wonderful to see that and be an uncle to them. Uh, is there anybody here on the faculty or PhD students of the history department? Do we have any history people here at all? OK. Anybody here is from history, find Chris right after the talk. Because he's currently in his sophomore year at William and & Mary. And he's interested in going into a PhD program in history down the road. And there aren't many better PhD programs in history than this one. So. <laughs> So I'm pimping for my nephew here. All right? <laughs> Let's be clear, all right? <laughs> um, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about, you know, this is not like the lecture that you may have seen me give before. This is a very pragmatic lecture. And one of the reasons that I had agreed to come back and give this is because Gabe had told me that, you know, and many other faculty members had told me that they had gotten so much tangible value about how to get more done and I truly do believe that time is the only commodity that matters. So this is a very pragmatic talk. And uh, it is inspirational in the sense that it will inspire you by giving you some concrete things you might do to be able to get more, time done, more things done in your finite time. So I'm going to talk specifically about how to set goals, how to avoid wasting time, how to deal with a boss. Originally, this talk was how to deal with your advisor, but I've tried to broaden it so it's not quite so academically focused, uh, and how to delegate to people. Uh, some specific skills and tools that I might recommend to help you get more out of the day, and to deal with the real problems in our life, which are stress and procrastination. I mean, if you can lick that last one, you're probably in good shape. And really, you don't need to take any notes, so I'll presume if I see any laptops open, you're actually just you know, doing IM or email or something. <laughs> uh, if, if you're listening to music, please at least wear headphones, I would always say. Uh, but all of this will be posted on my website. And just to make it really easy, uh, if you want to know when to look up, uh, any slides that have a red star on them are the points that I think you should really make sure that you, you got that one. All right? And conversely, if it doesn't have a red star, well. Uh, all right. So the first thing I want to say is that Americans are very, very bad at dealing with time as a commodity. We're really good at dealing with money as a commodity. I mean, we're, as a, as a culture, very interested in money and how much somebody earns is a status thing and so on and so forth. But we don't really have time elevated to that. People waste their time uh, and, and just always fascinates me. And one of the things that I noticed is that very few people equate time and money, and they're very, very equatable. So the first thing I started doing when I was a teacher was asking my graduate students, well, how much is your time worth an hour? Or if you work at a company, how much is your time worth to the company? What most people don't realize is that if you have a salary, let's say you make $50,000 a year, it probably costs that company twice that in order to have you as an employee because there's heating and lighting and other staff members and so forth. So if you get paid $50,000 a year, you are costing that company. They, make, they have to raise $100,000 in revenue. And if you divide that by your hourly rate, you begin to get some sense of what you are worth an hour. And when you have to make trade-offs of, should I do something like write software, or should I just buy it, or should I outsource this, having in your head what you cost your organization an hour is really kind of a, a staggering thing to change your behavior. Because you start realizing that, wow, if I free up three hours of my time, and I'm thinking of that in terms of dollars, that's a big savings. So start thinking about your time and your money almost as if they are the same thing. And of course, Ben Franklin knew that a long time ago. So you've got to manage it. 
And you gotta manage it just like you manage your money. Now I realize not all Americans manage their money. That's what makes the credit card industry possible. Uh, and, and, that's, and apparently mortgages too. So, but most people do at least understand, they, they don't look at you funny if you say, well, can I see your monetary budget for your household? In fact, if I say your, your household budget, you presume that I'm talking about money, when in fact the household budget I really wanna talk about is probably your household time budget. Uh, at the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon, students would come in and during the orientation I would say, this is a master's program, everybody's paying full tuition, and uh, it was roughly $30,000 a year. And, and the first thing I would say is, if you're gonna come into my office and say, I don't think this is worth $60,000 a year, I will throw you out of the office. I'm not even gonna have that discussion. And of course, they would say, oh God, this Pausch guy's a real jerk. And then they were right. But <laughs> what I then followed on with was, because the money is not important, you can go and earn more money later. And what you'll never do is get the two years of your life back. So if you wanna come into my office, and talk about the money, I'll throw you out. But if you wanna come into my office and say, I'm not sure this is a good place for me to spend two years, I will talk to you all day and all night because that means we're talking about the right thing, which is your time, because you can't ever get it back. A lot of the advice I'm gonna give you, particularly for undergraduates, how many people in this, in this room are undergraduates by show of hands? Okay, good, still young. <sighs> um, a lot of this, uh, what did Hans and Franz on Saturday Night Live, if you're old enough? Hear me now, but believe me later, right? Uh, a lot of this is gonna make sense later, and one of the nice things is I gave, gave his volunteer to put this up on the web. I, I understand that people can actually watch videos on the web now. So this is... Uh, so a lot of this will only make sense later, and uh, when I talk about your boss, if you're a student, think about that as your academic advisor. If you're a PhD student, think of that as your PhD advisor. And uh, if you're, you know, if you're watching this and you're a young child, think of this as your parent because that's sort of the person who is in some sense your boss. And the, the talk goes very fast and I, as I said, I'm very big on specific techniques. I'm not really big on platitudes. I mean, platitudes are nice, but they don't really help me get something done tomorrow. The other thing is that one good thief is worth 10 good scholars. And in fact, you can replace the word scholars in that sentence with almost anything. All right. Uh, so almost everything in this talk is to some degree inspired, which is a fancy, fancy way of say, saying lifted, uh, for, from these two books. And I, I found those books very useful, but it's much better to get them in a distilled form. So what I've basically done is, is, is collected the nuggets for your behalf. I like to talk about the time famine. I think it's a nice phrase. Does anybody here feel like they have too much time? Okay, nobody, excellent. And I like the word famine because it's a little bit like thinking about Africa. I mean, you can airlift all the food you want in to solve the crisis this week, but the problem is systemic and you really need systemic solutions. So a time management solution that says, oh, I'm gonna fix things for you in the next 24 hours is laughable, just like saying I'm gonna cure hunger in Africa in the next year. You need to think long-term and you need to change fundamental underlying processes because the problem is systemic. We just have too many things to do and not enough time to do them. The other thing to remember is that it's not just about time management. That sounds like a kind of a lukewarm, you know, a talk on time management. That's kind of, you know, milk toast. But how about if the talk is, how about not having ulcers? All right, that catches my attention. Uh, so a lot of this is life advice. This is how to change the way you're doing a lot of the things and how you allocate your time so that you will lead a, a happier, more wonderful life. And I loved in the introduction that you talked about fun. Because if I've brought fun to academia, well, it's about damn time. <laughs> Whew. Uh, I mean, you know, if you're not gonna have fun, why do it, right? That's what I wanna know. I mean, life really is too short. If you're not gonna enjoy it, you know, people who say, well, I'm, you know, I've got a job, but I don't really like it. And I'm like, well, you could change. <laughs> well, that would be a lot of work. You're right, you should keep going to work every day doing a job you don't like. Thank you, good night, right? Uh, so the overall goal is fun. Um, my middle child, Logan, is, is my favorite example. I don't think he knows how to not have fun. Now, granted, a lot of things he does are not fun for his mother and me. <laughs> but he's loving every second of it. And he doesn't know how to do anything that isn't ballistic and full of life. And he's gonna keep that quality, I think. He's my little tigger. And uh, I always remember Logan when I think about, the goal is to make sure that you lead your life. You know, I wanna maximize use of time, but really that's the means, not the end. The end is maximizing fun. People who do intense studies and, and log people and videotape them and so on and so forth, say that the typical office worker wastes almost two hours a day. 
right? Their desk is messy, they can't find things, misappointments, unprepared for meetings, they, they can't concentrate. Does anybody in here, by show of hands, ever have any sense that one of these things is part of their life? <laughs> okay, I think we've got everybody. So this is a universal thing, and you shouldn't feel guilty if some of these things are plaguing you, because they plague all of us. They plagued me, for sure. And the other thing I want to tell you is that uh, it sounds a little cliched and trite, but being successful does not make you manage your time well. Managing your time well makes you successful. If I have been successful in my career, I assure you it's not because I'm smarter than all the other faculty. I mean, I'm looking around and looking at some of my former colleagues. I mean, I see Jim Cahoon up there. I am not smarter than Jim Cahoon, <laughs> okay? <laughs> You know, I, I constantly look around the faculty at places like the University of Virginia or Carnegie Mellon, and I go, damn, these are smart people, right? And I snuck in. Uh, <laughs> but what I like to think I'm good at is the meta skills, because if you're going to have to run with people who are faster than you, you have to, like, find the right ways to optimize what skills you do have. So let's talk first about goals, priorities, and planning. Anytime anything crosses your life, you've got to ask, this thing I'm thinking about doing, why am I doing it? Almost no one that I know starts with the core principle of there's this thing on my to-do list, why is it there? Because if you start asking, well, why is it? I mean, again, my kids are great at this. That's all I ever hear at home is why, 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 right? And sooner or later, they're going to stop saying why, and they're just going to say, okay, I'll do it, right? Uh, so ask why am I doing this? What is the goal? Why will I succeed at doing it? And here's my favorite. What will happen if I don't do it? If I just say, yeah, I'm just not, the best thing in the world is when I have something on my to-do list, and I just go, mm, no. <laughs> no one has ever come and taken me to jail. Uh, I talked my way out of a speeding ticket last week. It was really cool. <laughs> it's like the closest I'm ever going to be to attractive and blonde. <laughs> and I, I told the guy, you know, why we had just moved and so on and so forth, and he looked at me and he said, well, for a guy who's only got a couple of months to live, you sure look good. <laughs> and I just pulled up my shirt to show the scar, and I said, yeah, I look good on the outside, but the tumors are on the inside. <laughs> you know, he just ran back to his cruiser. And <laughs> <laughs> so that's one positive law enforcement experience for me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so the police have never come because I crossed something off my to-do list. And, and that's a very powerful thing because you just get all that time back. The other thing to keep in mind when you're doing goal setting is a lot of people focus on doing things right. And I think it's very dangerous to focus on doing things right. I think it's much more important to do the right things. If you do the right things adequately, that's much more important than doing the wrong things beautifully. All right? It doesn't matter how well you polish the underside of the banister. Okay? And keep that in mind. Uh, Lou Holtz had a, a great list. Uh, Lou Holtz says 100 things to do in his life. And he would sort of once a week look at it and say, you know, if I'm not working on the, those 100 things, why was I working on the others? And I just think that's a, an incredible way to frame things. Uh, there's something called the 80-20 rule. Sometimes you'll hear about the 90-10 rule. But the key thing to understand is that a very small number of things in your life or on your to-do list are going to contribute the vast majority of the, val the value. So if you have, if you're a salesperson, 80% of the revenue is going to come from 20% of your clients. And you better figure out who those 20% are and spend all of your time sucking up to them because that's where the revenue comes. Uh, so you've got to really be willing to say, this stuff is what's going to be the value and this other stuff isn't. And you've got to have the courage of your convictions to say, and therefore, I'm going to shove the other stuff off of the boat. The other thing to remember is that uh, experience comes with time, and it's really, really valuable, and there are no shortcuts to getting it. So good judgment comes from experience. And experience comes from bad judgment. So if things aren't going well, that probably means you're learning a lot and it'll go better later. <laughs> uh, this is, by the way, why we pay so much in American society for people who are you know, typically older but have done lots of things in their past because we're paying for their experience because we know that experience is one of the things you can't fake. And do not lose, the sight, do not lose sight of the power of inspiration. So Randy's in a in an hour-long talk, and you know, we've already hit our first Disney reference. Uh, <laughs> Walt, Disney's, uh, quote, Walt Disney has many great quotes, but one I loved is, if you can dream it, you can do it. And a lot of my cynical friends say, yada, 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 to which I say, shut up. <laughs> All right. Inspiration is important, and I'll tell you this much, if you, I don't know if Walt was right, but I'll tell you this much, if you refuse to allow yourself to dream it, I know you won't do it. So the power of dreams 
are that they give us a way to take the first step towards an accomplishment. And Walt was also not just a dreamer. Walt worked really hard. Uh, Disneyland, this amazes me, because I know a little bit about how hard it is to put theme park attractions together. And they did the whole original Disneyland park in 366 days. That's from the first shovel full of dirt to the first paid admission. Right? Think about how long it takes to do something, say, at a state university. <laughs> By comparison. So it's, uh, you know, it's just fascinating. When someone once asked Walt Disney, how did you get it done in 366 days? He just deadpanned, we used every one of them. Right. So again, there are no shortcuts. shortcuts. There's a lot of hard work in anything you want to accomplish. All right. Planning is very important. One of the time management cliches is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. And planning has to be done at multiple levels. I have a plan every morning when I wake up and I say, what do I need to get done today? What do I need to get done this week? What do I need to get done each semester? That's sort of the time quanta, because I'm an academic. And that doesn't mean you're locked into it. And people say, well, yeah, but things are so fluid. You know, I'm going to have to change the plan. And I'm like, yes, you are going to have to change the plan. But you can't change it unless you have it. And the excuse of I'm not going to make a plan because things might change is just this paralysis of I don't have any marching orders. So have a plan, acknowledge that you're going to change it, but have it so you have the basis to start with. To-do lists. How many people here right now, if I said, can you produce it, could show me their to-do list? OK, not bad, not bad. The key thing with to-do lists is you have to break things down into small steps. Uh, I literally, once on my to-do list when I was a junior faculty member here at the University of Virginia, I put, get tenure. <laughs> that, that was naive. <laughs> um, and I, I looked at that for a while and I said, oh, that's really hard. I don't think I can do that. Uh, and um, my children, Dylan and Logan and Chloe, particularly uh, Dylan, is at the age where he can clean his own damn room, thank you very much. But he doesn't like to. And uh, Chris is smiling because I used to do this story on him, but now I've got my own kids to pick on. Uh, <laughs> but Dylan will come to me and say, I can't pick up my room. It's too much stuff. <sighs> he's not even a teenager, and he's already got that move. You know? <sighs> and I say, well, can you make your bed? Yeah, I can do that. OK, can you put all the clothes in the hamper? Yeah, I can do that. And you know, you do three or four things, and then it's like, well, Dylan, you just cleaned your room. I cleaned my room. Right? And he feels good. He is empowered. Uh, and everybody's happy. And of course, I've had to spend twice as much time managing him as I could have done it by myself, but that's OK. That's what being a boss is about, is growing your people, no matter how small or large they might be at the time. <laughs> the last thing about to-do lists or getting yourself going is if you've got a bunch of things to do, do the ugliest thing first. There's an old saying, if you have to eat a frog, don't spend a lot of time looking at it first. And if you have to eat three of them, don't start with the small one. <laughs> All right, this is the most important slide in the entire talk. So if you want to leave after this slide, I will not be offended because it's all downhill from here. And this is blatantly stolen. This is Stephen Covey's great contribution to the world. He talks about it in the one in um, uh, the Seven Habits book. Uh, it's imagine your to-do list. Most people sort their to-do list either, you know, the order that I, I got it, throw it on the bottom, or they sort it in due date list, which is more sophisticated and more helpful, but still very, very wrong. So looking at the four quadrant to-do list, if you've got a quadrant where things are important, excuse me, and due soon, important and not due soon, not important and due soon, and not important and not due soon, all right, uh, which of these four quadrants do you think? Upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right. Which one do you think you should work on immediately? Upper left. Upper left. <laughs> you are such a great crowd. OK. And which one do you think you should probably do last? Lower right. And that's, you know, that's easy. That's obviously number one. That's obviously number four. But this is where everybody, in my experience, gets it wrong. What we do now is we say, I do the number ones, and then I move on to the stuff that's due soon and not important. When you write it in this quadrant list, it's really stunning, because I've actually seen people do this, and they say, OK, and this is due soon, and I know it's not important, so I'm going to get right to work on it. <laughs> and the most crucial thing I can teach you about time management is when you're done picking off the important and due soon, that's when you go here. 
you go to, it's not due soon and it's important, and there will be a moment in your life where you say, hey, this thing that's due soon but not important, I won't do it. Because <laughs> it's not important. It says so right here on the chart. <laughs> And magically, you have time to work on the thing that is not due soon but is important so that next week it never got a chance to get here because you killed it in the crib. My wife won't like that metaphor. Uh, <laughs> but you kill the, or you, you, you solve the problem of something that's due next week when you're not under time stress because it's not due tomorrow. And suddenly you become one of those Zen like people who just always seem to have all the time in the world because they've figured this out. All right, paperwork. The first thing you need to know is that having cluttered paperwork leads to thrashing. You end up with all these things on your desk and you can't find anything and the moment you turn to your desk, your desk is saying to you, I own you. I have more things than you can do. And they are many colors and laid out. Uh, so what I find is that it's really crucial to keep your desk clear, and we'll talk about where all the paper goes in a second, and you have one thing on your desk, because then it's like, ha, ah, now it's Thunderdome. Me and the one piece of paper, right? And so I usually win that one. Uh, one of the mantras of time management is touch each piece of paper once. You get the piece of paper, you look at it, you, you work at it, and I think that's extremely true for email. How many people here well, I'm going to take it for granted that everybody here has an email inbox. How many people right now have more than 20 items in their email inbox? Oh, I'm in the right room. <laughs> your inbox is not your to-do list. And I, my wife has learned that I need to get my inbox clear. Now, sometimes this really means just filing things away and putting something on my to-do list. But remember, the to-do list is sorted by importance, but my e does anybody here have an, e have an email program where you can press the sort by importance button? You know, it, it, it's amazing how people who build software that really is a huge part of our life and getting work done haven't a clue. And I, that's not a slam on any particular company. I think they all have missed the boat, and I just find it fascinating. Uh, because everybody I know, or most people I know, have this inbox that, all right, I gotta ask, how many people have more than 100 things in their email inbox? <laughs> oh, I'm just not gonna keep going, this is too depressing. <clears throat> um, so, you really wanna get the thing in your inbox, look at it and say, I'm either gonna read it right now, or I'm gonna file it and put an entry in my to-do list. And, and that's just a crucial thing, because otherwise, every time you go to read your email, you're just swamped, and it's just as bad as the cluttered paper. You're all trying to figure out how that heading goes with that picture. <laughs> a filing system is absolutely essential. And I know this because I married the most wonderful woman in the world, but she's not a good filer. <laughs> but she is now. Because <laughs> after we got married and we moved in together and we resolved all the other typical couple things, I said, we have to have a place where our papers go and it's in alphabetical order. And she said, well, that sounds a little compulsive. <laughs> and I said, okay, honey. So I went out to Ikea, and I got this big, nice, way too expensive, big wooden, fake mahogany thing with big drawers. So she liked it, because it looked kind of nice. And having a place in our house where any piece of paper went and was in alphabetical order did wonderful things for our marriage. Because there was never any of this, honey, where did you put blah, blah, blah. Right? And there was never being mad at somebody because they had put something in someone else's place. There was an expected place for it. And when you're looking for important receipts or whatever it is, this is actually important. And uh, we have found that this has been uh, a wonderful thing for us. I think file systems among groups of people, whether it's a marriage or an office, are crucial. But even if it's just you, having a place where you know you put something really beats all hell out of running around for an hour going, where is it? I know it's blue. And I was eating something when I read it. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is not a filing system. This is madness. A lot of people ask me, so Randy, what does your desk look like? So as my wife would say, this is what Randy's desk looks like when he's photographing it for a talk. Uh, uh, the important thing is that I'm a computer geek, so I have the desk off to the right, and then I have the computer station off to the left. 
I like to have my desk in front of a window whenever I can do that. Uh, this is an old photograph. These have now been replaced by LCD monitors, but I left the old picture because the crucial thing is it doesn't matter if they're fancy high tech. The key thing is screen space. Lots of people have studied this. How many people in this room have more than one monitor on their computer desktop? Okay, not bad. So we're getting there. It's starting to happen. Uh, what I've found is that I could go back from three to two, but I just can't go back to one. There's just too many things, and as somebody said, it's the difference between working on a desk, like at home, and trying to get work done on the little tray on an airplane. In principle, the little tray on the airplane is big enough for everything you need to do. It's just that in practice, it's, it's pretty small. So multiple monitors, I think, are very important, and I'll show you in a second what I have on each one of those. Uh, and I believe in this multiple monitor thing. We believed in it for a long time. That's, uh, that's my research group, um, our, our laboratory a long time ago at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, that's Caitlin Kelleher, who's now Dr. Kelleher, thank you, and she's at Washington University in St. Louis uh, doing, doing wonderful things. Uh, but we, we had everybody with three monitors, and the cost on this is absolutely trivial. If you figure the cost of adding a second monitor to an employee's yearly cost to the company, it's not even 1% anymore. So why would you not do it? So one of my walkaways for all of you is you should all go to your boss and say, I need a second monitor. I just can't work without it. Randy told me to tell you that. Because <laughs> right. it, it will increase your productivity, and the computers can all drive two monitors, so why not? So what do I have on my three monitors? On the left is my to-do list, uh, all sorts of stuff in there. Um, and my system, we're all idiosyncratic, my system is that I just put a number zero through nine and I use an editor that can quickly sort on that number in the first column. But the key thing is it's sorted by priority. In the middle is my mail program. Note the empty inbox. <laughs> and I try very hard. I sleep better if I go to sleep with the inbox empty. When my inbox does creep up, I get really testy. So my wife will actually say to me, I think you need to clear the inbox. <laughs> on the third one is a calendar. That's, uh, this is from a number of years ago, but that's kind of like what my, my, uh, my days would be. I used to be very heavily booked. And I don't care which software you use. I don't which, care which calendar you use. I don't care if it's paper or computer. Whatever works for you, but you should have some system whereby you know where you're supposed to be next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Because even if you can live your life without that, you're using up a lot of your brain to remember all that. And I don't know about you, but I don't have enough brain to spare to use it on things I can have paper or computers do for me. Uh, so back to the overview. Uh, on the desk itself, let's zoom in a little bit. Look, I have the one and one thing I'm working on at the time. Uh, I have a speakerphone. This is crucial. How many people here have a speakerphone on their desks? OK, not bad, but a lot more people don't. Speakerphones are essentially free. And uh, I spend a lot of time on hold, and that's because I live in American society where I get to listen to messages of the form, your call is extremely important to us. <laughs> Watch while my actions are cognitively dissonant from my words. <laughs> you know, it's like the worst abusive relationship in the world. I mean, imagine a guy picks you up on the first date and he smacks you in the mouth and says, I love you, honey. That's, that's pretty much how modern customer service works on the telephone. Uh, but the great thing about a speakerphone is you hit the speakerphone and you dial, and then you just do something else. And if it takes seven minutes, it takes seven minutes. And hey, I just look at this as somebody's piping music into my office. That's very nice of them. Uh, I also found that having a timer on the clock on the, on the phone is handy so that when somebody finally picks up in Bangalore, I can, uh, I, I can say things like, uh, I'm, I'm so glad to be talking with you. By the way, if you're keeping records on this sort of thing, I've been on hold for seven and a half minutes. But you don't say it angry. You just say it as I presume you're logging this kind of stuff. And you're not angry, so they don't get angry back at you, but they feel really guilty. And, and that's good. You want guilty, right? Uh, so a speakerphone is really great. I find that a speakerphone is probably the best material possession you can buy to counter stress. If I were like teaching a yoga and meditation class, I'd say, we'll do all the yoga and meditation. I think that's wonderful stuff. But everybody also has to have a speakerphone. Uh, what else do we have besides a speakerphone? Let's talk about telephones for a second. <clears throat> I think that the telephone is a great time waster. And I think it's very important to keep your business calls short. So I recommend standing during phone calls. Great for exercise. 
And if you tell yourself, I'm not going to sit down until the call is over, you'll be amazed how much brisker you are. Uh, start by announcing goals for the call. Hello, Sue. This is Randy. I'm calling you because I have three things that I wanted to get done. Boom, boom, boom. Because then you've given her an agenda. And when you're done with the three things, you can say, that's great. Those are the three things I had. It was great to talk to you. I'd love to talk to you again. Bye. Boom. We're off the phone. Whatever you do, do not put your feet up. I mean, if you put the feet up, you're, it's just all over. And the other handy trick is have something on your desk that you actually are kind of interested in going to do next. So that the phone call, instead of being, wow, I can get off the phone and go do some work, or I could keep chit-chatting. And usually the person you've called, they'd like to chit-chat too. Right? So this is where the time waster in the office goes. And if you're a grad student, <laughs> well, if you're a grad student, you already know about time wasting. Uh, <laughs> So having something you really want to do next is a great way to get you off the phone quicker. So you've got to train yourself. Uh, getting off the phone is hard for a lot of people. I don't suffer from an abundance of politeness. So my, my sister, who's known me for a long time, is laughing a knowing laugh. Uh, so uh, when I want to get off the phone, I want to get off the phone. I'm done. And uh, what I say is, you know, I'd, I'd love to keep talking with you, but I have some students waiting. Now, I'm a professor. Somewhere, there must be students waiting. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's, it's got to be. Uh, now, sometimes you get in a situation like with a telemarketer, right? And uh, that's awkward because a lot of people are so polite. Now, I have no trouble with telemarketers. I'll just go there with them. Right? If you're a telemarketer and you call my house, you have made a mistake. <laughs> right? Yeah, I can't talk right now, but why don't you give me your home phone number, and I'll call you back around dinner time. You know, Seinfeld did a great bit on that. Or, or if you want to be a little bit more over the line, uh, I'd love to talk with you about that. But first, I have some things I'd like to sell you. <laughs> and the funny part is they never realize you're yanking with them. That's, <laughs> uh, but if you have to hang up on a telemarketer, what you do is you hang up while you're talking. Well, I, I think that's really interesting, and I would love to keep, you know. <laughs> I mean, talk about self-effacing. <laughs> hanging up on yourself. And, and they won't figure it out. And if they do and they call back, just don't answer, right? So uh, a, uh, 10 years from now, all anybody will remember from this talk is hang up on yourself. Uh, the other thing is group your phone calls. Call people right before lunch or right before the end of the day. Because then they have something they would rather do than keep chitty chatting with you. So I find that calling somebody at 11.50 is a great way to have a 10 minute phone call. Because frankly, you may think you're interesting, but you are not more interesting than lunch. <laughs> uh, I have become very obsessive about phones and using time productively. So I, I just think that everybody should have something like this. I don't care about fashion, so you know, I don't have Bluetooth. And you know, I have this big, ugly thing. Hi, I'm Julie from Time Life. Right? Uh, <laughs> but the thing this allows me to do because uh, you know, I am sort of living the limit case right now of I've got to get stuff done and I really don't have a lot of time. So uh, I get an hour a day where I exercise on my bike. And this is me on my bike. And if you look carefully, you can see I'm wearing that headset and I've got my cell phone. And for an hour a day, I ride my bike around the neighborhood. This is time that I'm spending on the phone getting work done. And it's not a moment being taken away from my wife or my children. And it turns out that I can talk and ride a bike at the same time. Amazing the skill sets I have. So uh, it works better in cold weather climate, in warm weather climates. But uh, I have just found that having a headset frees me up. Even if it's just around the house, you wear a headset, you can fold laundry. It's an absolute twofer. And uh, I just think uh, telephones should have headsets. And someday we will all have the Borg implant, and it will be a non-issue. Uh, what else is on my desk? I have sort of one of those address stampers because I got tired of writing my address. Uh, I have a box of Kleenex. In your box at work, if you're a faculty member, you have to have a box of Kleenex. Because if it, <laughs> Jim is laughing, right. Uh, you know, at least if you teach the way I do, <laughs> there will be crying students in your office. And, and what I found to diffuse a lot of that is that I would have CS352 or whatever written on the side of the Kleenex box. And I would turn it as I handed it to them. And they would take the Kleenex and they would be like, oh, I said, yeah, you're, you know, it's for the class. You know. <laughs> you're not alone. So having Kleenex is very important. Um, and thank you cards. Um, 
I'll now ask the embarrassment question. And I don't mean to pick on you, but it just points things out so well. By show of hands, who here has written a thank you note that is not a quid pro quo? I don't mean, oh, you gave me a gift, I wrote you a thank you note. And I mean a physical thank you note with a pen and ink and paper, not, not email. Because email's better than nothing, but it's that much better than nothing. Okay. Uh, how many people here have written a thank you note in the last week? Not bad. I do better here than at most places, because it is UVA. <laughs> Chivalry is not that. But that's how many people in the last month? How many people in the last year? The fact that there are a non-trivial number of hands not up for the year means that anybody who's in this audience, his parents are going, ooh, that was my kid. Uh, thank you notes are really important. Uh, they're, they're a very tangible way to tell someone how much you appreciated things. I have thank you notes with me, and that's because I'm actually writing some later today to some people who've done some nice things for me recently. And you say, well, God, do you have time for that? And I'm like, yes, I have time for that, because it's important. Even in my current status, I will make time to write thank you notes to people. And even if you're a crafty, weaselly bastard, <laughs> you should still write thank you notes, <laughs> because it makes you so rare that when someone gets a thank you note, they will remember you. Right? It seems like the only place that thank you notes are really taken seriously anymore is when people are interviewing for jobs. They now sometimes write thank you notes to the recruiters, um, which I guess shows a sign of desperation on the part of the recent graduates. Uh, but thank you notes are a wonderful thing, and I would encourage all of you to go out and buy a stack at your local dime store and have them on your desk so that when the moment seizes you, it's right there. And I leave my thank you notes out on the desk readily accessible. Uh, and as I've said before, gratitude is something that can go beyond cards. When I got tenure here, I took my whole research team down to Disney World on my nickel for a week. And I just, I believe in large gestures, but you know, it's also, it was a lot of fun. I wanted to go too, right? Uh, I didn't send them without proper chaperoning, after all. Uh, what else? I have um, a, a paper recycling bin, and this is very good because it helps save the planet, but it also helps save my butt. So when I have a piece of paper that I would be throwing away, I put it in that bin, and that takes, I don't know, a couple of weeks to, uh, to get filled up and then actually sent somewhere else. And so what I've really done here is I've created sort of the Windows Macintosh trash can you can pull stuff back out of. It works in the real world, too. And about once a month, I go ferreting through there to find the receipt that I didn't think I'd ever need again that I suddenly need. And it's, it's extremely handy. I suspect that if I were giving this talk in 10 years, I would say I just put it in the auto scanner. Right? Because I, I find it almost inconceivable that 10 years from now, first off, that a lot of the stuff would be paper in my hands anyway. But if it were paper, that I would have any notion of doing anything other than putting it on the desk where it goes zzz, and it's already scanned because it touched the desk. Right? You know, this kind of stuff is not really hard to do. So I think that's what's going to happen. And of course, I have a phone book, uh, um, notepad. I can't live without Post-it notes. Right? I mean, you know, uh, and the view out the window of the dog. Because the dog reminds me that I should be out playing with him. Uh, we have, uh, we had the, when I got married, I married into a family. Uh, I got a wife and two beautiful dogs. There's the other one. Um, <laughs> could you help me with the debate I've had with my wife? Uh, by show of hands, how many people would semantically say the dog is on the couch? <laughs> Nobody. Thank you. Thank you. Because the dog was not allowed on the couch. <laughs> and my wife came in one day. <laughs> and anyway, thank you for agreeing with me. It, it makes me feel very good. Um, so the dog is wonderful. I, the dogs have long gone on, but they are still in our hearts and our memories. And, and I think of them every day. And they're, they're, just, they're still a part of my life. Uh, I've presented to you how I do my office, how I do things. It's not the only way. Uh, one of the best assistants I've ever met was a woman named Tina Cobb. And she has a completely different system. She's a spreader. <laughs> right? If you think about it, there's a method to her madness. Everything here is exactly one arm's radius from where she sits. You know, it's, it's like a two-armed octopus. And she got so much stuff done. And I never presumed to tell somebody else how to change their system if their system is working. Tina was much more efficient than I was. So you know, I would just say, look, do what works for you. And everybody has to find the system for themselves. But you really got to think about what makes me more efficient. Now, let's talk about office logistics. In most office settings, people come into each other's offices and proceed to suck the life out of each other. <clears throat> If you have a big, cushy chair in your office, you might as well just slather butter all over yourself and send yourself naked into the woods for the wild animals to attack you. 
I say make your office comfortable for you and optionally comfortable for others. So no comfy chairs. I used to have folding chairs in my office, folded up against the wall. So people who want to come into me and talk with me, they can stand. And I would stand up because then the meeting's going to be really fast because we want to sit down. But then if it looks like it's something that we should have a little more time on, I very graciously go over and open the folding chair. I'm such a gentleman. Uh, <clears throat> some people do a different tack on this. They have the chair already there, but they cut two inches off the front leg. So the whole time you're in their office, you're sort of scooting yourself up. <laughs> I'm not advocating that, but I thought it was damn clever the first time I saw it. Uh, scheduling yourself. Uh, verbs are important. You do not find time for important things. You make it. And you make time by electing not to do something else. There's a term from economics that everybody should hold near and dear to that heart, and that term is opportunity cost. The bad thing about doing something that isn't very valuable is not that it's a bad thing to have done it. The problem is that once you spend an hour doing it, that's an hour you can never again spend in any other way, and that's important. Now, how do you keep these unimportant things from sucking into your life? You learn to say no. It's great. My, uh, my youngest child, Chloe, is at an age where this is her new word. About two weeks ago, she learned it. And it's like, now everything is, no, 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 no. She should be giving this talk. <laughs> and I asked her, and she said, no. <laughs> so she's home playing. <laughs> all right? But we all hate to say no, because people ask us for help, and we want to be gracious. So let me teach you some gentle no's. The first one is, I'll do it if I'm really strapped, but I want to help you. I don't want you to be in the bind. So if nobody else steps forward, I will do this for you. All right? Or I'll be your deep fallback, but you have to keep searching for somebody else. Now, you will find out about the person's character at that moment, because if they say, great, whew, I got my sucker, and they stop looking, then they have abused the relationship. But if they say, that's great, my stress level is down at zero, because now I know it's not going to be a disaster, but I'm going to keep looking for somebody for whom it's less of an imposition. That's a person that will get lots of this sort of support. Okay? When uh, I was in graduate school, we did a moving party with four people. A lot of moving parties carry heavy objects. We had four people. We should have had 12. It was a long day. And after that, I adopted a new policy. I said, from now on, when somebody says, will you help me move, I'll say, how much stuff you got? And they would tell me, and I'd say, hmm, that sounds like about eight people. If you give me the names of seven other people that'll be there, I'll be there. And I never again was at a moving party that went for 14 hours in January in Pittsburgh. <clears throat> uh, everybody has good and bad times. Uh, a, a big thing about time management is find your creative time and defend it ruthlessly. Spend it alone, maybe at home if you have to, but uh, defend it ruthlessly. The other thing is find your dead time, schedule meetings, phone calls, exercise, mundane stuff, but do stuff during that where you don't need to be at your best. And we all have these times. And the times are not at all intuitive. I discovered that my most productive time was between 10 p.m. and midnight, which is really weird, but it's sort of this, for me, it's just this burst of energy right before the end. Let's talk about interruptions. Uh, an interruption, there are people who measure this kind of stuff, who have stopwatches and clipboards, and what they say is that an interruption takes typically six to nine minutes but then there's a four to five minute recovery to get your head back into what you're doing. And if you're doing something like software creation, you may never get your head back there. The cost can be infinity. <clears throat> but if you do the math on that, five interruptions blows a whole hour. So you've got to find ways to reduce both the frequency and the length of these interruptions. One of my favorites is turn phone calls into email. If you phone my office at Carnegie Mellon and it says, hi, this is Randy, um, please send me email. Uh, again, I presume everybody here has email. How many people here, when a new message comes in, does your computer go ding or make some other noise? Do we still have people doing that? What the heck is wrong with you people? <laughs> and, and I love the fact that computer scientists just know nothing about anything. So for years, by default, all these packages out of the box would go ding every time you get a new piece of email. So we had taken a technology explicitly designed to reduce interruption, and we'd turned them into interruptions. So you just got to turn that off. The whole point of email is you go to it when you're ready, not you're sitting around like Pavlov's dog saying, oh, maybe I'll get another email. <laughs> In the same way you try to not interrupt other people, 
I save stuff up, so I have boxes for Tina or for my research group meeting, and I put stuff in those boxes, and then once a week or however often when the box gets full, I walk down the hall and I interrupt that person one time and say, here are the eight things I have for you. How do you cut things short? Because people always want to spend more time than you want to spend. Well, you can say, look, somebody interrupts you and says, you know, got a few minutes, and I say, well, I'm in the middle of something right now. And that tells them, I'm interrupting it, I'm going to do it quickly, but I've got to get back to that. Or you can say, I only have five minutes. The great thing about that is that later you have the privilege of extending that if you so choose, but when the five minutes are up, you can say, well, I said at the beginning I only had five minutes and I really have to go now. So it's, it's a very socially polite way to bound the amount of time on the interaction. If somebody's in your office and they don't get it, now I'm not saying that as a computer scientist I have an inordinate amount of time to interact, opportunity to interact with people with no social skills. <laughs> <clears throat> But uh, if you have someone in your office who is just not getting it, what you do is you stand up, you walk to the door, you compliment them. For some reason, this is a crucial part of the process. <laughs> you thank them, and you shake their hand. And if they still don't leave, which is pretty much a guarantee that you're dealing with someone from my tribe, <laughs> then you're in the doorway, you just keep going. <laughs> What I have found is that people don't like it when you look at your watch while you're talking with them. So what I do is I put a wall on the clock right behind them so it's just off axis from their eyes, and I can just kind of glance over a little bit when I need to see what time it is. It's a very nice way to get me information without being rude to them. Time journals. Time is the commodity. You better find out where your time is going. So monitor yourself and update it throughout the day. You can't wait till the end of the day and say, what was I doing at 10.30? Because our memories aren't that good. So what you do, and I really hope that technology within you know, another five years or so will be so good that the time journals can be created automatically, or at least some facsimile of it. But until then, what we do is we monitor it ourselves. So this is what an empty time journal would look like. The details aren't important, but the key thing is that when you fill it in, you've got a bunch of categories and what I was doing, and you can do this very informally, but you get a lot of real data about where your time went. And it's always very different. Anybody who's done monetary budgeting, you look at it and you go, wow, I didn't know I was spending that much on dry cleaning or restaurants. It's always a fascinating surprise. And you always spend more than you think. But with time budgets, you find out that the time is just going wildly differently than you would have imagined. The best example of this I know is uh, Turing Award winner Fred Brooks's time clocks. He's a brilliant computer scientist. But he also has this great array of clocks in his office. And when you go in and talk to him, he says, is, is this meeting about research or teaching or whatever? And then he flips the appropriate switch. And at the end of the week, he knows exactly where his time went. <laughs> the man is a genius. <clears throat> Uh, when, uh, when I meet with students, and this is, I think, just as appropriate for people in the workplace, I say, what's your schedule? You have a set of fixed meetings every, every time, every week, and what you have to do is you have to look at those and, and identify the, the open blocks where you're going to waste time, and I can tell you're going to waste time just by looking at it. So in this case, you've got a class where uh, you've got a class at a certain point, and then you've got a gap until the next class. So I've identified those here. And the gaps between classes that in this case last an hour or an hour and a half, this is just prime time to be wasted. So what I always taught my students was make up a fake class. The fake class is go to one specific place in the library during that hour. And when you're sitting there with just you in the library and your books, there's a pretty good chance you might actually study. So don't go and hang out with friends for an hour. Just make that a fake class. Make your own little study hall. It's a simple trick, but it's amazing how effective it is when somebody just explicitly does it. When you've got your time journal data, what do you figure out from that? What am I doing that doesn't need to be done? What can someone else do? I love every day sort of saying, what am I doing that I could delegate to somebody else? Um, my sister is again laughing because she knows who that person was in our youth. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what can I do more efficiently? And how am I wasting other people's time? When you get good at time management, you realize that it's a collaborative thing. I want to make everybody more efficient. It's not a selfish thing. It's not me against you. It's how do we all collectively get more done? Uh, as you push on the time journal stuff, you start to find that you don't make yourself more efficient at work so you can become some sort of uber worker person. You become more efficient at work so you can leave at five and go home and be with the people that you love. People call this work-life balance. For the junior faculty, you may have heard of it <laughs> in some sort of mythical sense, 
but it is, it is possible. Uh, I found that I worked less, I worked fewer hours after I got married and I got more done. And I was always fascinated in graduate school that the people who graduated fastest with their PhDs were the people who had a spouse and kids. And I said, how can that be? That's like a built-in boat anchor, <laughs> right? You know, you got all these other demands on your time and I'm like a single guy and I got all the time in the world and that's the problem. I approach it like I got all the time in the world so my time isn't precious. When you've got a spouse and little kids, your spouse is likely to say things to you like, you better not be in at that grad school more than 40 hours a week. So when you come in, you're not sitting around playing computer games. Not that I ever did that. <laughs> but when you come in, you're coming in and you're doing work. And I, I found, like most people, that once I got married and had kids, my whole view of time management really got, I mean, we were playing for real stakes now. Because now there are people whose lives are impacted if I'm spending too much time at work. Uh, the other thing about time management, it makes you really start to look through a crystalline lens and figure out what's important and what's not. I love this picture. <laughs> I've blanked out her name, but this says blah, 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 blah. Wor this is a pregnant woman, and it says she is worrying about the effect on her unborn child from the sound of jackhammers. <laughs> so they're doing construction, and the people here are laughing because they can see that this woman who's so concerned about the jackhammers affecting her unborn child is holding a lit cigarette. You got to get really good at saying, I got to focus my time and energy on the things that matter and not worry about the things that don't. Now, I'm not a medical doctor and I don't play one on TV, but I'm willing to bet that if I were the fetus, I'd be saying, put the cigarette out, mom, I can deal with the noise. <laughs> All righty. So in terms of, I want to tell you a little story about effective versus efficient. I actually was going to give this talk a couple of weeks ago and I talked with Gabe about it. And um, uh, we were going to come up here because as a surprise for my wife, her favorite musical group in the whole world is the police and has been for a long, long time. They're a wonderful group. And so we said, hey, we're going to drive up to Charlottesville and see them. We managed to get some tickets. And I said, well, honey, well, as long as we're up there, I promised Gabe a long time ago that I wanted to give my time management talk. And she said, OK, because it's about a three hour drive. So it's very efficient to couple these two trips together. And about two days later, she said, you know, honey, I know how you are with talks. And before you give one for a couple of days, you start to obsess. Uh, and, and as we talked through it, she said, so we're going to go up and this couple's time away, we'd gotten a sitter to watch the kids, and this couple's time away is going to be eaten up by you obsessing over and preparing this talk. And I thought about it and I said, okay, so obviously the right solution is we should keep our couple's time, our couple's time, we'll go up, we'll see the concert, you know, we'll have our time together, and I'll just schedule a different day and I'll go up on a one day trip and I'll do the talk. And she said, wow, that was easy. And I was, right, once you frame it in the right way and you say, yeah, the cost here is that I have to do the drive a second time, but it turns out I'm doing the drive with my nephew Christopher and we talk and my mom it turns out. So the time wasn't even dead time, so there was no loss at all. But the key thing was we said, it's not about efficiency, it's about effectiveness and best overall outcome. And of course, one of the nice things was that we did get to go to the police concert and I really want to thank Gabe and, and Jim Ayler because we really went to the concert. <laughs> and my wife was very happy. I'm the guy in the back saying, she's not paying any attention to me today. <laughs> but, it, but it was wonderful. And he is, he is a charming gentleman in person. He is absolutely charming. So let's talk about procrastination. Uh, there's an old saying, procrastination is the thief of time. Procrastination is hard. And I have a little bit of an insight here for you. We don't usually procrastinate because we're lazy. Sometimes people rationalize their procrastination. They say, well, gee, if I wait long enough, maybe I won't have to do it. Right? That's true. Sometimes you get lucky. All right? Uh, but, and other people say, gee, if I start on it now, I'm just going to spend all the time on it. If I, only, if I only give myself the last two days, I'll do it in two days because that's the work expands to fill the time available, Parkinson's law. That's marginally true. But I think the key balance here is to understand that doing things at the last minute is really expensive. And it's just much more expensive than doing it just before the last minute. So if you're doing something and you can still mail it through the US mail, you have suddenly avoided the, oh my god, I've got to do the whole FedEx thing. Now, I love FedEx. FedEx supports our whole universal habit of procrastination. <laughs> but it also allows us to get stuff there when it really has to be there in a hurry. So that's a wonderful thing. But I think you have to, uh, uh, you have to realize that if you push things right up to the deadline, that's where all the stress comes from. Because now you can't reach people, 
Uh, if somebody is out of the office for just one day, your whole plan is upset, so you really have to work hard on this kind of stuff. The other thing is that deadlines are really important. We are all essentially deadline driven, so if you have something that isn't due for a long time, make up a fake deadline and act like it's real. And that's wonderful because those are the deadlines when push comes to shove. You can slip them by a couple of days and it's all right, so they're less stressful. If you are procrastinating, <clears throat> you've got to find some way to get back into your comfort zone. Identify why you're not enthusiastic. Whenever I procrastinate on something, there's always a deep psychological reason. Usually it's I'm afraid of being embarrassed because I don't think I'll do it well, or I'm afraid I'm going to fail at it. And sometimes it involves asking somebody for something, and one of the most magical things I've learned in my life is that sometimes you just have to ask, and wonderful things happen, but you just have to you know, step out and do that. Uh, <clears throat> I, I won the parent lottery. I have just wonderful parents, and my dad unfortunately passed away not too long ago. But this is one of my favorite photographs, because my dad was such a smart guy, I could almost never surprise him or impress him, because he was just that good. But we were down on a family vacation at Disney World, and the monorails were going by, and we're going to board the monorail. And we noticed that in the, uh, in the front, up here in the cabin, I don't know if you can see it in this picture, but there's an engineer who drives the monorail, and there were actually guests up in there with him, which is kind of unusual. My dad and I were talking about that, and I, I knew, because I've done some consulting for Disney. My dad's saying, oh, they probably have to be special VIPs or something like that. I said, oh, there is a trick. There is a special way you get into that cabin. And he said, really, what is it? And I said, I'll show you. Dylan, come with me. And Dylan, who's, who's the back of his head, you can see there, we walk up and I whisper to Dylan, ask the man if we can ride in the front. <laughs> and we go up to the attendant and the attendant says, why, yes, you can. And he opens the gate and my dad is just like. <laughs> I said, I told you there was a trick. I didn't say it was hard. <laughs> and sometimes all you have to do is ask. And it's that easy. Let's talk about delegation. Nobody operates individually anymore and you can accomplish a lot more when you have help. However, most people delegate very poorly. They treat delegation as dumping. I don't have time to do this, you take care of it. You know, and then they micromanage and it's just a disaster. The first thing if you're gonna delegate something to a subordinate is you grant them authority with responsibility. You don't tell somebody, go take care of this, but if you need to spend any money, you gotta come back to me for approval. Uh -uh. That's not empowering them, that's telling them you don't trust them. If I trust you enough to do the work, I trust you enough to give you the resources and the budget and the time and whatever else you need to get it done. You give them the whole package. The other thing is delegate, but always do the ugliest job yourself. So when we need to vacuum the lab before a demo, I bring in the vacuum cleaner and I vacuum it. All right? Do the dirtiest job yourself so it's very clear that you're willing to still get the dirt on your hands. Treat your people well. People are the greatest resource and if you are fortunate enough to have people who report to you, treat them with dignity, respect, and, you know, to sound a little bit corny, the kind of love that they should have from someone who cares about them and their professional development. And for crying out loud, staff and secretaries are your lifeline. Right? If you don't think you should treat them well because it's a decent thing to do, at least treat them well because if you don't, they will get you. <laughs> right? And they will get you good and you will deserve it and I will applaud them. <laughs> My giving a talk on time management with Alf Weaver in the audience. Where is Alf? There he is. Uh, that's like talking about surviving the Jonestown flood if Noah's in the audience. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that Alf Weaver taught me is whether it's to a colleague or to a subordinate, if you want to get something done, you cannot be vague. And he said, you give somebody a specific thing to do, a specific date and time. Thursday is not a specific time. Thursday at 322 gets somebody's attention and you give them a specific penalty or reward that will happen if that deadline for that thing is not met. And then he paused and he said, and remember, the penalty or reward has to be for them, <laughs> not you, right? I will be screwed over if you don't meet that deadline. Oh, bummer, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is an important point to not get wrong. Uh, challenge people. Uh, I've been told that one of the tricks is you delegate until they complain. I don't know about until they complain, but what I've found is that under delegation is a problem. People are usually yearning for the opportunity to do more. They want to be challenged. They want to prove to you and themselves they can be more capable, so let them. Uh, communication has to be clear. So many times people get upset with their bosses because there's a misunderstanding. And particularly in a time of email, it's so easy to communicate via email. Even if you've had a face-to-face -face conversation, send a two-line email just to be specific afterwards. And it's not like we're trying to be all lawyer-like. It's just that as uh, Judge Wapner said, get it in writing 
if you remember the people's court. And Judge Wapner said, if there isn't a problem, it's not a problem. It didn't take you much time. But if there ever is a problem, well, wait a second, there won't be a problem because there's a written record. And that's the magic. There won't be a confusion because you can't disagree about the written word. Don't give people how you want them to do it. Tell them what you want them to do. Give them objectives, not procedures. Let them surprise you with a way of solving a problem you would never have imagined. Sometimes those solutions are mind-blowing, good or bad. <laughs> but they're really much more fun than just having them do it the way you would have done it. And you know what? If you're in a university, your job should be to have people smarter than you, i.e. your students, and they will come up with stuff you would never have thought of. The other thing is tell people the relative importance of each task. I meet so many people who say, oh, my boss is an ogre. They gave me five things to do. I'm like, well, did they tell you which one was the most important? Oh, yeah. Hmm. I guess I could ask that. Knowing that if you have five things, which are the ones to get done is really important, because if you're flying blind, you've got a 20% chance of getting them done in the right order. And delegation can never be done too young. <laughs> Does everyone see the difference in the two pictures? This is my daughter, Chloe. I love her to death, but I want her to grow up to be a wonderful person, and I know the sooner she holds her own bottle, the better. <laughs> Sociology, beware upward delegation. Sometimes you try to delegate and people try to hand it back to you. One of the best things I ever saw was someone who had a secretary trying to say, I can't do this, you'll have to take it back, and he just put his hands behind his back and took a step backwards. <laughs> and then he waited. And then eventually the secretary said, or maybe I could find this other solution. And he said, that's wonderful. I'm so proud you thought of that. Right? It was just it was a, an elegant gesture. Uh, reinforced behavior won't be repeated. One of my favorite stories in the One Minute Manager is he talks about, did you ever wonder how they got the killer whales to jump through the hoop? If they did it like modern American office managers, they would yell at the killer whale, jump through the hoop. And then every time the killer whale didn't jump through the hoop, they'd hit it with a stick. <laughs> right? I mean, this is how we train people in the office place. Uh, read the book if you want to see how they actually do it, because I'm curious. I mean, it's, I know now, but it's really cool how they do, get them to do it. So reinforced behavior you want repeated. When people do things that you like, praise them and thank them. That's worth more than any amount of monetary reward or a little plaque. People really like to just be told straight up, thank you, I really appreciate that you did a good job. Uh, the other thing is that uh, if you don't want things delegated back up to you, don't learn how to do them. I take great pride. I don't know how to run photocopiers and fax machines, and I ain't going to learn. Right? That's certainly not how I'm not going to spend my remaining time. Uh, meetings. The average executive spends more than 40% of his or her time in a meeting. My advice is when you have a meeting, lock the door, unplug the phone, and take everybody's Blackberries. Because if it's worth our time, it's worth our time. If it's not worth our time, it's not worth our time. But I don't have any interest in being in a room with six people who are all half there because that's very inefficient. I don't think meetings should ever last more than an hour, with very rare exception. And I think that there should be an agenda. I got into a great habit a couple of years ago when I just started saying, if there's no agenda, I won't attend. And the great thing about that is whoever called the meeting had to actually think before they showed up about why we were supposed to be there. Because otherwise, it's like, well, why are we here? Because we had a meeting. It's on all of our calendars. It's, it's just a classic Dilbert moment. <laughs> so most important thing about meetings, and again, this, uh, this comes from the One Minute Manager, one minute minutes. At the end of a meeting, somebody has to have been assigned the scribe, and they write down in one minute or less what decisions got made and who is responsible for what by when, and then they email it out to everybody. Because if you don't do that, you have your next weekly meeting next week, and you all sit around going, now who was going to do this? Right? It's very inefficient. And it's so fast to just do these one minute minutes. Let's talk about technology. People, you know, I'm a computer scientist, so they say, which gadget will make me more time efficient? And I don't have an answer for that. It's all idiosyncratic. But I will tell you that my favorite comment about technology comes from a janitor at the University of Central Florida who said, computers are faster, they just take longer. <laughs> that's zen right there. <laughs> so that's another way of saying only use technology that's worth it. And worth it is end to end did it make me more efficient. And that depends on how you work and we're all different. Uh, and remember that technology is getting insane. I walked into a McDonald's and I ordered, you know, Happy Meal number two, and they said, "Would you like a cell phone with that?" Uh, I went to the grocery store to buy 16 slices of American cheese, and you get Grolier's Encyclopedia. So, with 16 slices of cheese, you get all of man's knowledge for free. <laughs> Let's 
That's just spooky scary. Uh, and remember that technology really has to be something that makes your life better. You guys may have seen this. I just find it very humorous. So only use technology that helps you. <laughs> I find that technology is good if it allows you to do things in a new way. Just doing the same things a little bit faster with technology is nice, but when technology changes the workflow. So I was carving pumpkins a few years ago, and this is FM, a good friend of mine, and you, I don't know if you can see it, but down by her right knee is a pattern, and you lay this pattern over the pumpkin, and you get this little special carving knife, and you can, instead of these amateurish pumpkins like I made, you get this sort of howling at the moon. And her husband Jeff and I thought this was really cool, but in sign of a reactionary burning man kind of a moment, we grabbed our power drills. <laughs> and we carved our pumpkins that way. Use technology if it changes the way you do things because you get, a, and, and believe me, the result of a power drill, you get these little, oh, it's just gorgeous. Let's talk briefly about email, because email is such a large part of all our lives. First off, don't ever delete any of it. Save all of it. I started doing this 10 years ago. Right? An interesting thing is that all the historians talk about, oh, it's such a shame. We don't have people keeping diaries. We don't know what their day is like. I'm like, you fools. We have just entered a society circa about 10 years ago, and I'm a living example of it. Every piece of my correspondence is not only saved, it's searchable. So if I were you know, a person of merit, a historian, which is a big stretch, a historian could actually look at my patterns of communication much better than the most compulsive diary writer. Now we could talk about whether or not I'm being intra, you know, introspective. That's, that's about content. But in terms of quantity, uh, it's great. And of course, you can save your email and you can search it. And it's just wonderful because you can pull back stuff from five years ago. So never delete your email. Uh, Here's a big email trick. If you want to get something done, do not send the email to five people. Hey, could somebody take care of this? Every one of those five recipients is thinking one and only one thing. I deleted it first. <laughs> right? So the other four people will take care of this. I don't have to. So you send it to one and only one person. But if you really want it to be done, send it to somebody who can do it. Tell them what, again, Alf Weaver, specific thing, specific time. And then the, the penalty can be more subtle, like you just CC their boss. All right? uh, and the other thing, and I've had to teach, I had this conversation with every student in my entire career, because they send email, and then they just wait for the person to respond. And I say, if the person has not responded within 48 hours, it's OK to nag them. And the reason it's OK to nag them, because if they haven't responded within 48 hours, the chance that they are ever going to respond is zero. I mean, maybe not zero, maybe that small. But in my experience, if people don't respond to you within 48 hours, you'll probably never hear from them, so just start nagging them. Uh, let's talk about the care and feeding of bosses. There's a phrase, managing from beneath. Because right? we all know that all bosses are idiots. That's certainly the expression, you know, the, the, the sense I've gotten from everybody who has a boss. Uh, when you have a boss, write things down. Do that clear communication thing. Ask them, when is our next meeting? What do you want me to have done by then? So you've got sort of a contract. Who can I turn to for help besides you, because I don't want to bother you? And remember, your boss wants a result, not an excuse. Uh, general advice on vacations. Phone callers should get two options. The first one is, when you're on vacation, the first option is, contact John Smith, not me. I'm out of the office, but this person can help you now if it's urgent. Or call back when I'm back. Why? Because you don't want to come back to a long sequence of phone messages saying, you know, hey, Randy, can you help me get care of this? And then you call them back, and you know, you've been on vacation for a week. They already solved it. And the other thing is that it's not a vacation if you're reading email. All right? Trust me on that. It's not a vacation if you're reading email. I can stay in my house all weekend and not read email, and it's a vacation. But if I go to Hawaii and I've got a Blackberry, I'm not on vacation. And I know this. When I got married, my wife and I got married, we left our reception in a hot air balloon, which did not have wireless on it. And uh, Dean Jim Morris at the time, uh, we took a month-long honeymoon, which was great, but not really long enough. And Jim Morris said, and I said, I'm not going to be reachable for a month. And Jim said, that's not acceptable. I said, what do you mean it's not acceptable? He said, well, I pay you. 
So that's the not acceptable part. And I said, oh, okay. There, and I said, so there has to be a way to reach me. And he said, yes. I said, okay. So if you called my office, there would be a phone answering machine message that said, hi, this is Randy. I'm on vacation. I waited until 39 to get married. And so we're going for a month. <laughs> and I hope you don't have a problem with that. But apparently my boss does. So he says I have to be reachable. So here's how you can reach me. My wife's parents live in blah, blah, blah town. Here's their names. If you call directory assistance, you can get their number. <laughs> and then if you can convince my new in-laws that your emergency merits interrupting their only daughter's honeymoon, they have our number. <laughs> Here's some of my most important advice. We close with some of the best stuff. Kill your television. People who study this say the average American watches 28 hours of television a week. That's almost three quarters of a full-time job. So uh, if you really want to get time back in your life, you don't have to kill your television, but just unplug it, put it in the closet, and put a blanket over it. See how long it takes you to get the shakes. <laughs> uh, turn money into time, especially junior faculty members or other people who have young children. This is the time to throw money at the problem. Hire somebody else to mow your lawn. Do whatever you need to do, but exchange, time for, exchange money for time at every opportunity when you have very young children because you just don't have enough time. It's just too hard. And the other thing is eat and sleep and exercise. Above all else, you always have time to sleep because if you get sleep deprived, everything falls apart. Other general advice, never break a promise, but renegotiate them if need be. If you've said, I'll have this done by Tuesday at noon, you can call the person on Friday and say, I'm still good to my word, but I'm really jacked up. And I'm going to have to stay and work over the weekend to meet that Tuesday deadline. Is there any way there's any slack on that? And a lot of times they'll say, Thursday's fine. Because I really need it Thursday, but I told you Tuesday. <laughs> or they'll say, oh, it's no problem. I can have Jim do that instead of you. He has some free time. Now, if they say, no, I, there's no wiggle room here, you say, that's OK. No problem. I'm still good to my word. All right. If you haven't got time to write, do it right, you don't have time to do it wrong. That's self-evident. Uh, recognize that most things are pass-fail. People spend way too much time. There's a reason we have the expression, good enough. It's because the thing is good enough. And the last thing is get feedback loops. Ask people in confidence. Because if someone will tell you what you're doing right or doing wrong, and they'll tell you the truth, that's worth more than anything else in the whole world. I recommend these two books. Time management is not a late-breaking field. Both these books are old books, but I recommend them highly. And it's traditional to close a talk like, with this, like this with, here's the things I told you about. I'm not going to tell you the things I told you about. I'm going to tell you the things that you can operationally go out and do today. First thing, if you don't have a day timer or a personal digital assistant, you know, a, a Palm Pilot or whatever, go get one. Put your to-do list in priority order. You can use the four quadrants or do what I do, just put a number zero to nine, but sort it by priority. And do a time journal. If that's really too much effort, just count the number of hours you watch of television in the next week. That's my gift to you. <laughs> and the last thing is, once you've got your day timer, make a note for 30 days from today. It's OK if that one goes ding, to remind you. And revisit this talk in 30 days. It'll be up on the web, courtesy of Gabe and ask, what have I changed? And if I haven't changed anything, then we still had a pleasant hour together. If you have changed things, then you'll probably have a lot more time to spend with the ones you love. And that's important. Time is all we have. And you may find one day you have less than you think. Thank you. amazing. Um, when me and Mandy first talked about him giving this talk, uh, I said, uh, well, we'll pick the biggest auditorium on campus, uh, Cabell Hall, right here, 850 people. 
And he said, do you really think we can get 850 people in a room to listen to this? And I said, uh, not only we'll do that, but we'll have to turn people away. And uh, it'll be the biggest attendance uh, since the Dalai Lama came here and gave a talk. And he said, big hitter, the Lama. <laughs> and after I started getting hundreds of emails from all of you and many other people who couldn't find seats here, but we'll have to see it on the web, I called Randy and I said, we're going to need a bigger boat. And uh, that's how it went. So, Randy, thanks again. We love you. And it was great. And there's, there's a refreshments, teas, and cookies in the uh, lobby. So go out there and have a snack, and we'll see you there. Thank you for coming.